And the seven are Jesus would be delivered over to the Gentiles. He would be mocked, shamefully treated and spit upon. He would be flogged. And we looked at all three of those last week. So today we're going to be looking at four, five, and six, which is the Messiah would be killed. He wouldn't just die, but he would die specifically for our sins. And number six, he would be buried. And then the last one, number seven, is what we'll do next week, that the Messiah would rise again from the dead on the third day. And we don't believe in coincidences around here. I know Bryce has talked about it. I've talked about it in the few messages I've done. But Olivia and I did not talk about what song. But she picked, under the guidance of the Holy Spirit, the song about the Lamb of God. And we're going to be talking about the Lamb of God today a little bit also, and how the blood of the Lamb of God removes our sins. Um, and the one verse in the New Testament that is just going to be kind of our, our verse to jump back into the Old is going to be 1 Corinthians 15, 3 through 5. And in this one verse, Paul gives us the three messianic prophecies that we're going to be looking at today, and he says these are in the scriptures. And like we said last week, when Paul says these are in the scriptures, he's talking Old Testament because the New Testament wasn't yet complete. So 1 Corinthians 15, 3 through 5 says, For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, that he was buried that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve. And if, a side note, if you guys are reading your New Testament, you come across Cephas, that's just Peter. Um, Cephas is the Aramaic, and Greek uh, is Peter. So it's the same, Cephas and Peter is the same, just in a different language. So the prophetic imagery of the Messiah dying for our sins is laced throughout the Old Testament. We could look at a lot of passages for that. Um, the main two that we're going to look at today are Psalm 22 and Isaiah 53. But I'm also going to briefly uh, mention the Passover. Not too long ago when Bryce was going through Exodus, we looked at the Passover in detail. So we're not going to go through it in detail today. The details of the Passover are Exodus chapter 12. But the Passover is a type of Christ, the perfect lamb as a sacrifice, the blood of which would protect those under it from the wrath of God. That was the, that was the image of the Passover. That's what Moses did when the Lord told him to sacrifice the Passover lamb, and whoever was in the house under that blood was saved from the destroyer. And we have indisputable New Testament confirmation that the Passover was intended to be a messianic um, prophecy. And that it was pointing to Jesus, the Lamb of God, who was going to take away the sins of the world. And that that image is fulfilled in him. In John chapter 1, verse 29, we read, John the Baptist, when John the Baptist sees Jesus, it says, The next day he, John the Baptist, he saw Jesus coming toward him and he said, Behold, the Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 7, Paul says, Cleanse out the old leaven, that you may be a new lump, as you really are unleavened. For Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed. So in the identification of Jesus right away, when John is starting to preach about Jesus coming, he points when he says, The Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. He's, he's talking about the Passover. They would have understood that, that the Lamb that takes away sin that Jesus is better than the Passover lamb because the Passover lamb didn't take away their sin, it just covered them. But Jesus takes away their sin. And then Paul in 1 Corinthians 5, 7, again, he makes that same connection saying Christ is the Passover lamb and he has been sacrificed. And then when you get to 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 19, Peter describes how we are saved by the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. So in these uh, Old Testament sacrifices, they were meant to point to Jesus. And he was the fulfillment of the Levitical system of blood sacrifice. In Hebrews chapter 10, verse 4, we read, For it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. And it's interesting if you're reading Hebrews chapter 10 sometime and you come across this verse, you might wonder, hmm, it says that the blood of bulls and goats doesn't take away sin. 
but it doesn't mention the lamb there. And I believe the reason that the writer to the he book of uh, Hebrews, Paul, we believe it's Paul, we don't know for sure, I believe why he doesn't say anything about lambs in that section is because he knew that the lamb pointed to Jesus. So while, yes, the Old Testament lamb did not take away sin, the ultimate lamb does. So the true spotless lamb being Jesus Christ, his blood can and does take away sin. And I think that's why Hebrews chapter 10 does not mention lambs, but, but um, bulls and goats. Because the sacrifice of Jesus Christ for the sins of humanity was always the plan from the beginning. And we read in Revelation chapter 13 verse 8. And it's talking about Jesus and it calls him the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. So when you guys are reading all these things about these offerings and you get to the lamb specifically, the lamb was supposed to be a picture of um, the Messiah that was going to come and die for the people. And New Testament confirms that, that that is what we're supposed to see when we're reading these um, Old Testament Levitical offerings. Um, another place we could go would be Genesis 22, when Abraham offers Isaac. That's, a, that's also a picture of uh, the prophetic death of the son. But that is actually going to be one of the focuses for next week. Uh, we're going to go through that actually for a different reason, because in that Genesis 22 episode, we actually will see there the three days of Jesus being dead. So we're going to save that one for next week. But the two that we're going to focus on mainly today is Psalm 22 and Isaiah 53. And these two chapters in the Old Testament, from a prophetic standpoint, are probably without equal in the Bible. That these two chapters are so detailed and so graphic that really they don't even require that much comment. Um, Psalm 22 actually reads as though it was dictated first person singular by Christ himself as he hung on the cross. And there are many scholars who do believe that when he was hanging on the cross, he actually did in fact quote the entire psalm. That when he started off, the first thing he said was, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? That was to draw everybody's mind to Psalm 22, because that's the opening line of Psalm 22. And since in those days they didn't have chapters, the chapters and verses that we have were added much later, that when Jesus starts off quoting Psalm 22, it was his way of saying, go to Psalm 22 because it's about me. That's what He was drawing their attention to that psalm. So we're going to go through that psalm, and I'm going to not, instead of going verse by verse, because really we don't have time for that, I'm going to go section by section. So I'm going to read, I'm going to read a chunk of verses, and then I'm going to offer some comments on that chunk. And so we're going to basically, we're going to leap from paragraph to paragraph, if you will. So the first chunk of verses that we're going to do is Psalm 22, 1 through 6. And it starts, <clears throat> To the choir master, according to the doe of the dawn, a psalm of David. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me from the words of my groaning? Oh my God, I cry by day, but you do not answer, and by night, but I find no rest. Yet you are holy, enthroned on the praises of Israel. In you our fathers trusted, they trusted and you delivered them. To you they cried and were rescued. In you they trusted and were not put to shame. But I am a worm and not a man, scorned by mankind and despised by the people. So, if... If the view is correct, and I think it is, that this was, in fact, written from a first-person, singular perspective of Christ on the cross, you might be wondering, and also, why did I ask Caleb to read verse 6 this morning? But I am a worm and not a man, scorned by mankind and despised by the people. Why would Jesus call himself a worm? And the answer, I think, is very, very interesting. The Hebrew word there that he uses is tola. So he said, I am a tola. It's a tola. It's it's the crimson worm. And the life cycle of this worm is where we get the insights as to why would Jesus call himself a worm. When the female crimson worm is ready to lay her eggs, which happens only once in her life, which, by the way, if you know in the New Testament, it also says Christ is stricken once. So the fact that this worm, only one time in her entire life does she lay her eggs. And the process that she goes through 
actually cost her her life. So that in of itself is just a small image. Why would he say I'm a worm? Because I'm going to die one time, just like this worm. I'm going to die one time for everybody. So this worm climbs up on a tree or a fence and attaches herself to it. She pierces the thin bark of the twigs to suck the sap from which she prepares a waxy scale to protect her soft body. So while she's attached to this wood, this tree or a fence post, um, a hard shell forms around her. And the shell is so hard and it's so secured to that piece of wood that the only way to get that shell off is to tear apart the body of the worm which would kill it. So it's fixed on there so strongly that you cannot remove it without killing the worm. The female worm lays her eggs under her body, which is under this protective shell. And when the larvae hatch, they remain under the mother's protective shell so the baby worms can feed on the living body of the mother worm for three days. Again, three days. And after the three days, the mother worm dies and her body excretes a crimson or scarlet dye that stains both the wood and the young worms. And that's why they're called scarlet worms because they carry that stain, that red coloring their entire lives. So on day four, the tail of the mother worm pulls up into her head, forming a heart-shaped body that is no longer crimson, but has turned into a snow-white wax that looks like a patch of wool on the tree or the fence. And it then begins to flake off and drop to the ground, looking like snow. So when we read in Isaiah chapter 1, verse 18, and it says, Come now, let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, they shall become like wool. So when Jesus Christ on the cross declares, I am a worm and no man, this is what he meant. He was pointing to this image of the crimson worm. He gave his life so that we could live. His blood washes us white. He was affixed to the tree and by so stains us with his blood so that we can become white. So he's a picture of that worm. And that's why in Psalm 22.6, that's what he meant. That's what I believe he meant by that. Okay, so the next block of verses in Psalm 22 is going to be 7 through 14. <clears throat> All who see me mock me. They make mouths at me. They wag their heads. He trusts in the Lord. Let him deliver him. Let him rescue him, for he delights in him. Yet you are he who took me from the womb. You made me trust you at my mother's breasts. On you was I cast from my birth. And from my mother's womb you have been my God. Be not far from me, for trouble is near, and there is none to help. Many bulls encompass me, strong ones of Bashan surround me. They open wide their mouths at me like a ravening and roaring lion. I am poured out like water, all my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax, it is melted within my breast. My strength is dried up like a potsherd, and my tongue sticks to my jaws. You lay me in the dust of death. For dogs encompass me. A company of evildoers encircles me. So what I want to focus on in this, ch in this chunk of verses is the strong ones of Bashan, the dogs, and the company of evildoers. Bashan was the Old Testament version of the gates of hell. In uh, Matthew 16, Jesus talks about the gates of hell. In the Old Testament, that was Bashan. It was the gateway to the underworld. And it was known as the place of the serpent. It's also associated with Mount Hermon. It's in the same geographical area as Mount Hermon, which is the place where the Jews believe that the rebellious sons of God in Genesis 6 descended when they came to earth and took human women in the episode that produced the Nephilim. And Bryce has gone through that a lot, Genesis chapter 6. So if you were living in that time and you wanted to conjure up images that would bring someone to the point of thinking about the demonic realm and death, you would talk about Bashan. So Jesus, at, at the moment of agony and death on the cross, when he says he's surrounded by the strong ones of Bashan, he's not talking about cattle. He says the bulls of Bashan, he's not, there weren't, there weren't cattle surrounding the cross. What he's talking about is the strong ones of Bashan, he's trying to get them to think about the powers of darkness that are coming at him. Both the rebel gods and the demon spirits who had been the foes of Yahweh and his children for thousands of years, are now attacking Yahweh in human flesh, which is Jesus as he's hanging on the cross. 
in that moment of weakness, voluntary weakness, the under the powers of the underworld basically are coming at him. That's what he's saying. So as just a as just a kind of more pop culture way to think about it, if anybody is familiar with the Narnia series, either the movies or the book, the scene where Aslan is voluntarily dying on the stone table while he's surrounded by the white witch's horde of creatures and monsters, that's that is an analogy to the bulls of Bashan. So if you're thinking, if you're familiar with Narnia and you think, oh, what's this Bulls of Bashan thing? That's C.S. Lewis painted a very vivid picture of it in The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe uh, when he had Aslan dying and all these creatures were coming from all sides. That's, that's what it means by the Bulls of Bashan. So also when it says that the strong ones of Bashan, when they open their mouths wide at me like a ravening and a roaring lion, it said that in, um, well, that section there, I'm not sure which verse exactly, but anyway, when we get to the New Testament, Peter, in 1 Peter 5, 8, he's talking to the church and he says, your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. I think Peter is also referring our minds back to Psalm 22. So just like he came at Jesus, they're going to come at us as believers. Um, but... We read in 1 John, greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world. So in Christ, we can overcome all those powers that come at us. So what I think is being described here by the bulls of Bashan, the dogs, and the company of evildoers is actually a coalition of the rebellious forces that come together to kill God. So the bulls represent the powers of darkness, as I mentioned. The dogs would represent the Romans. You say, what is that? How would that work? Because the Jews of the day would refer to Gentiles as goyim, or it was like a derogatory term, or they would refer to them as dogs. So I think when they're writing here, the dogs would be the Gentile powers that are coming at them, which would be, in that case, the Romans. And the company of evildoers would be the Jewish leadership. All these, all these were joined together in that moment to kill Jesus at the crucifixion. And Jesus actually, I think, gives us the confirmation of this in Luke 22, 53. When they come to arrest him, he says, When I was with you day after day in the temple, you did not lay hands on me. But this is your hour and the power of darkness. So he's talking to the humans and he says, This is your hour. You're allowed to attack me now. And not only you, but the powers of darkness also. And when Jesus is talking to Pilate in John 19, verse 11, he says, you would have no authority over me at all unless it had been given to you from above. Therefore, he who delivered you over to me has the greater sin. So the authority that they had to attack Jesus, Jesus actually allowed it. He said, you know, um, earlier in his ministry, he said, nobody can take my life from me, but I lay it down willingly. So he gave them the authority in that moment to fulfill the prophecies. And it's very interesting in John chapter 8, verse 44, when Jesus is talking to the Pharisees at the time, they were attacking him, calling him all kinds of names. He actually, he says to them, you are of your father, the devil, and your will is to do your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks out of his own character for he is a liar and the father of lies. So it's easy to gloss over that. And I've probably read that verse, I don't even know. I've probably read that verse 10 times in my life going through John. And only in more recent last few times did I see what he was saying there. He's telling them that you are going to do, that's your desire to do the will of your father. And then he says your father's the devil. So we could look at that and we said, well, what's the will of the devil that these people are going to try to accomplish? Well, the will of the devil has been to kill God and to take his place. So in Isaiah 14, verse 12 through 14, I'm actually going to read this. Uh, instead of the Hebrew translation, I'm going to read this one out of the Aramaic just because it, it makes uh, another point I'm going to make a little clearer. Um, so the Aramaic out of Isaiah 14, we read, How are you fallen from heaven, O shining one, son of dawn? How are you felled to the earth, O vanquisher of the nations? Once you thought in your heart, I will climb to the sky higher than the stars of God, I will set my throne. I will sit in the Mount of Assembly on the summit of Zephon. 
I will mount the back of a cloud. I will match the most high. So we can go through those things that Satan says he's going to do or he's going to attempt to do. And when it says that he's going to sit on the Mount of Assembly on the summit of Zephon, he's basically saying, I'm going to, I'm going to take the seat of God in the council. I'm going to take his seat. And then when he claims to be the one that's going to mount the back of a cloud and match the Most High, that one is a title of the cloud rider. We've gone through that in the past. That's one of those titles that's always in the Bible used of the God of Israel. So when Satan says that he's going to try to do that, he's saying, I'm going to take the place of the God of Israel. So in order to take the place of the God of Israel, he has to kill the God of Israel. So in Daniel, uh, I guess before I go into Daniel, so I think when Jesus in John 8 is saying, your will is to do your father's desires, that's what he means. Your father, the devil's desire is to kill me and take my place, and you're going to fulfill, because I allow it, I'm, you're going to fulfill his desires. So in Daniel 9.26, is another prediction about the Messiah we read that he would be executed, but not for himself. In Daniel 9.26, when Daniel's going through, the actually it's the angel that gives Daniel this prophecy, he straight up says the Messiah is going to die, but not for himself. So who did the Messiah die for? He died for us. He was executed for a capital crime that we committed. Um, that language in the Hebrew talks about being executed for a capital offense, but it was our capital offense that he paid for. But the charge with which they at least justified executing Jesus was because he claimed to be the cloud rider. He claimed to be the God of Israel. When he was on trial in Mark 14, 61 through 64, again the high priest asked him, Are you the Christ, the Son of the Blessed? And Jesus said, I am. And you will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of power and coming with the clouds of heaven. And the high priest tore his garments and said, What further witnesses do we need? You have heard his blasphemy. What is your decision? And they all condemned him as deserving death. So we can read again. We, when we read things in the English, we, we don't have oftentimes the Jewish mindset. And we're not as familiar with the scriptures that they understood more clearly uh, because we're you know, we're Western civilization Gentiles more often than not. But when Jesus said, you will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of power and coming with the clouds of heaven, they immediately understood he's quoting Daniel 7.13, which Daniel 7.13 is one of those passages where we see the cloud rider and he is in heaven and he's there with the Ancient of Days. So when Jesus is saying, that's me and you're going to see me, he's basically, he's claiming to be Yahweh. So that is why they killed him. They said, you have heard his blasphemy because they didn't believe that he was Yahweh when he kept over and over saying that he was. And so this is the final time that they killed him for basically being God. He told him he was God. They didn't believe him. And they accused him of blasphemy and they killed him for it. So they thought that by killing him, they could take his inheritance. Luke 20, verse 14, we read that. And that, I believe, applies both to the humans and to the powers of darkness. The Pharisees thought, if we kill him, we can take his inheritance. We'll, we'll keep our position here. Um, the life that they, that they were used to living in, in uh, the power and the authority that they had from the priesthood. But also the powers of darkness thought they could take his inheritance. If we kill God, we can have what's his. But they didn't understand that it was by his death that he would redeem mankind, then that he would rise again to give us life. And another prediction, Hosea chapter 13, verse 14. And guys, there's just all these little prophecies here and there. I mentioned last week that it's a puzzle, that the Old Testament gives you glimpses here and there, but there's so many glimpses. There's so many little pieces that it's, it's really a tapestry. And when you get the little pieces, there's so many of them that it just becomes, it becomes overwhelming, the evidence. But Hosea 13, 14, and this is God speaking, 
He says, I shall ransom them from the power of Sheol, which is the underworld. I shall redeem them from death. So it doesn't get more, I mean, it doesn't get more blatant than that, that God is going to redeem mankind. So when we read Paul, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 6 through 8, Paul says, Yet among the mature we do impart wisdom, although it is not a wisdom of this age or of the rulers of this age who are doomed to pass away, but we impart a secret and hidden wisdom of God, which God decreed before the ages for our glory. None of the rulers of this age understood this, for if they had, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. So what Paul's saying is, if the powers that were in charge, both human and supernatural, if they had understood that by killing him, it was going to fulfill his exact mission, they never would have done it. But they didn't understand they didn't understand the prophecies. They didn't have all the pieces put together correctly so that they thought if we kill him, we can take his place. But as we'll see next week, no, it's actually by killing him that they sealed their own fate. And that was the plan all along, but they just didn't understand it. So the next, uh, the next chunk here we're going to do is uh, 22. I'm going to reread 14 and then go through 18. He says, I am poured out like water, and all my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax, it is melted within my breast. My strength is dried up like a potsherd, and my tongue sticks to my jaws. You lay me in the dust of death, for dogs encompass me, and a company of evildoers encircles me. They have pierced my hands and feet. I can count all my bones. They stare and gloat over me. They divide my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. So, I don't know if you guys picked up on it right there, but one of the main things he said was, they pierced my hands and my feet. Which, as New Testament believers, we can clearly say that's talking about crucifixion. They crucified him, they nailed him to the tree. But I just want to share this because when you guys start doing deeper Bible study, you're going to run into people who try to claim that the reading, they pierced my hands and my feet, that that's an inaccurate reading. They want to say, well, that's not what the Hebrews says. And the problem is that argument doesn't hold up when you serious, do serious textual examination. And there are scholars who do that. They'll compare every manuscript of every text in all the languages to try to get the most accurate reading we can get. And I've listened to a couple scholars that are in the textual criticism world. And they say that there's some Hebrew manuscripts, the Septuagint, which is the Greek, the Vulgate, which is Latin, and the Syriac all support the Pierce reading. So the Pierce reading has support in all those manuscripts and all those languages. And there are a few, they do, they do say, yes, it's true, that there are some Hebrew manuscripts that have a different reading. And the different reading is, quote, a lion, my hands and my feet. Which doesn't really make a lot of sense. So they look at that and... I can't do it off the top of my head, and I don't have it in my notes, but they go through how, in the Hebrew language, how a slight variation in the lettering could get you from, they pierced my hands and my feet, to a lion, hyphen, my hands and my feet. But again, the reading of a lion, my hands and feet, doesn't really do much for anybody. Like, what are we supposed to get from that? Um... But the scholars, they do believe the textual evidence strongly supports the pierced reading. And the reason that people want to argue for the lion instead, they want to say, oh, it's talking about a lion, is because the people who support that view, more often than not, don't want to have such a blatant description of crucifixion a thousand years before he was born. So they have an agenda in trying to say, no, it's supposed to say a lion. Even though, like I said, Septuagint, Vulgate, Syriac, and some Hebrew all have pierced. But, even if you're going to grant them, okay, all the evidence aside, you guys want to say a lion. Well, you still cannot get away from the Messiah being pierced, because Zechariah 12.10. 
It says, And I will pour out on the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem a spirit of grace and pleas for mercy, so that when they look on me, on him whom they have pierced, they shall mourn for him as one mourns for an only child, and weep bitterly over him as one weeps over a firstborn. So, in Zechariah chapter 12, verse 10, we get pierced again, and it's clearly talking about God there. In fact, it's, it's actually talking, we've talked in the past about two powers where sometimes you're not sure if it's talking about God the Father or God the Son. This is one of those passages, because if you notice the language, he says, he starts off, he says, so that when they look on me, and then he transitions on him whom they've pierced. I think you have both there. The Father and the Son are both, are both in that verse, and the language kind of transitions from me to him. Because it's God the Father talking, and then he says, on him whom they pierce, because they pierce the Son. And this is another example of why, when I mentioned last week, we don't have every um, prophecy or every point of theology in one spot, is because if it's more spread out, it's much more difficult for God's enemies to corrupt the text. So even if they have this variant reading in Psalm 22. It doesn't really say pierced. Well, it does. First of all, it does. But you also have in Zechariah chapter 12 the exact same language, and it's not in dispute there. God's saying, they, pier they pierce me. So I just, wanted to, I just wanted to share that because you guys may run into that as people trying to say that it doesn't mean crucifixion in Psalm 22, but also... We have another verse in the Old Testament that clearly says he was pierced. So uh, the next chunk is actually I'm going to finish Psalm 22. I'm going to read 19 through 31. But you, O Lord, do not be far off. O you, my help, come quickly to my aid. Deliver my soul from the sword, my precious life from the power of the dog. Save me from the mouth of the lion. You have rescued me from the horns of the wild oxen. I will tell of your name to my brothers. In the midst of the congregation, I will praise you. You who fear the Lord, praise him. All you offspring of Jacob, glorify him and stand in awe of him. All you offspring of Israel, for he has not despised or abhorred the affliction of the afflicted. And he has not hidden his face from him, but has heard when he cried to him. From you comes my praise in the great congregation. My vows I will perform before those who fear him. The afflicted shall eat and be satisfied. Those who seek him shall praise the Lord. May your hearts live forever. All the ends of the earth shall remember and turn to the Lord. And all the families of the nations shall worship before you. For kingship belongs to the Lord and he rules over the nations. All the prosperous of the earth eat and worship. Before him shall, <clears throat> excuse me, before him shall bow all who go down to the dust, even the one who could not keep himself alive. Posterity shall serve him. It shall be told of the Lord to the coming generation. They shall come and proclaim his righteousness to a people yet unborn that he has done it. So just a couple of comments on this section. Um, when it says up above there, in the midst of the congregation, I will praise you. We've talked some in the past about the idea of the divine council, about how God, he doesn't need a council, but he has one um, to be a part of the decision making. Like I said, not that he needs it, but he's given uh, his imagers, his image bearers, um, some authority to, to be involved in how the universe runs. So when here, when Jesus says, in the midst of the congregation, I will praise you, the congregation there. I believe we're seeing a glimpse of the re-inclusion of humanity into the divine council. So when Adam rebelled, humanity was cut off from being a part of the divine council. But here in Psalm 22, there's also some passages in Hebrews that talk about um, at the resurrection, we will be reintroduced into the council again and have our, have our place that Adam lost. We'll get it back through Christ. So I think we're seeing that there in Psalm uh, 22 also. And then there at the very end, he talks about the nations and the kings um, and the Lord ruling over the nations. That's going to be part of our main focus for next week. 
because it's the resurrection that leads to the reclaiming of the nations. So we're going to go into that actually as, as um, a big part of what we're going to do next week. And just very briefly here as we're getting, we're getting late is that there's a couple verses in Isaiah 53. I was going to go through the entire chapter quickly, but we, we don't have the time for it right now. But I'm just going to read a couple things out of Isaiah 53. Because it's about Jesus dying for our sins, the Messiah dying for our sins. Specifically, it says, Isaiah says that he will be stricken for the transgression of my people in one place in Isaiah 53. In another place, it says, They made his grave with the wicked and with a rich man in his death, although he had done no violence and there was no deceit in his mouth. So the prophecy that says Jesus is going to be buried, you find that in Isaiah 53. And one thing I wanted to share with you guys in particular is that when you read Isaiah 53, and it says he will be with a rich man in his death, the Hebrew there is actually in the what's called the noun is in the common masculine plural construct. So there's some grammar, a little bit of Hebrew grammar there. What that means is that it's a plural noun. So it could read his deaths. He will be a rich man in his or with a rich man in his deaths. So we could think about that. Why would the Hebrew there for the deaths, plural, of the Lord's servant, the Messiah? be that way? I think it's because it's indicating even that early on that the death of the Messiah would be for each one of us individually. His deaths. One for you, one for everybody, one for me. His deaths, plural. He would die to pay for our transgression. And as we continue there, towards the end of 53 it says, Yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him. He has put him to grief. When his soul makes an offering for guilt, he shall see his offspring, he shall prolong his days. So again, the Messiah is going to be offered for guilt, for our guilt, but he will prolong his days. There's a glimpse of the resurrection there. And the resurrection is going to be our focus next week, but we get a glimpse of it here also, Isaiah 53. He will die, but he isn't going to stay that way. He will prolong his days. He's going to come back from the dead. So... Throughout the Law and the Prophets, and I've, tr I've tried to pick a lot of prophecies because I want you guys to see the intricacy of the Old Testament and how it's applied to the New and how many times, by how many different prophets, in how many different ways, God has told us what he's going to do. He's gonna, he told us, and then it happened. And we see that in picture form, we see that prophetically in images and patterns, and we see it just in verbatim, this is what I'm going to do, and then he does it. So prophecy is pattern, and it's also prediction and fulfillment. So we can see both of those things play out through the lives of the Old Testament uh, saints, and we see it literally just also in, this is what I'm going to do, and then he does it. So we see that throughout the law and the prophets, God revealed his eternal plan of redemption to mankind. He described it in advance how the Messiah was going to be sacrificed and also raised from the dead for, for us. This plan he purposed before he had even formed humanity. God wasn't surprised when Adam sinned. He knew that it was going to happen. And then he accomplished the redemption through Jesus Christ so that we, through faith in Christ, can have victory now and forever. So let's pray. God, I just thank you, Lord, for these group of students that you brought this morning. God, I thank you for the intricacy, like I said, of your word, and how many times you've told us in various ways, in various places, through various prophets, Lord, and through various, whether it's through parables or images or just flat statements that you've made, God, what you're going to do, and how every single time you said it, you've done it to the full and to the perfect 100% completion. Lord, we just pray that, God, you would watch over us this week, that you would increase each of our desire for you, for the things of you, Lord, and that you would open your word to our understanding. Fill us each with your Holy Spirit. Bind the powers of darkness, Lord, that would seek to distract us and lead us away from you. And help us to walk, Lord, in the power of your resurrection. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.